I'm Tom Ray, and this is my art podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet... I'm T.L. Luke, and I am a freelance illustrator. I'm from Palmyra, Wisconsin, and that is the, like, southeastern tip of the Kettle Moraine Forest. Like, literally an hour drive southeast of Madison. Oh. Like, 60 minutes Population 1600, very small. My family thinks, like, why our house is haunted is <laughs> because we, like, built on top of something we maybe shouldn't have. Was this before or after seeing Poltergeist, maybe? <laughs> no, I actually have never seen Poltergeist really? yet. Okay. In the television, the one that, like, like, don't go into the light or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, I have seen that, but I saw it, like, a year ago. Like, really? somewhat recently. Yes. Okay. Wasn't that, like... We moved the cemetery, but we never moved the bodies. So <laughs> like, what kind of that what <laughs> poltergeist is? I think it is. Yeah, like they buried it, or they they built the house just on top of it, and then they yeah. never told them. I think it is. What was the kind of horrors that were happening in this in this small town that you were in? Our house. It was definitely like things moving, really weird little happenings tables moving and come on yeah like cords moving and just like these really i don't know i have like a really funny story about this weird event that happened in my bedroom that was just like the rose from my ex-girlfriend like pushed off some like figurines off of a shelf that like hit me in the head and i was and then i got up to turn off the radio that i was listening to and then my itunes turned on on my computer while i was away that and it was playing a song called soul which was just funny <laughs> and then i turned that off and then all of a sudden it tells me do you want to leave sticky keys on and like it was uh -huh. just like one thing after another that was just it was so funny like when it was happening but it was definitely one of those like what? Like, this is weird. Like, this is this is too weird. It just That's makes right, it sound yeah. like your ghost was an IT person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, it was just like, I don't know why I'm stuck in this girl's bedroom. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know. So just like a bunch of weird little happenings and right. yeah. Well, how did you, uh, or why did you end up leaving the town? I never wanted to stay there. <laughs> you know, it was great for like growing up as a kid, being directly in front of a forest and that's you know a lot of my influence in my art right now comes from little girls wandering forests and spirits or weird animals and mm. like very ultra creative imagination kind of realms went to college then moved as far as i was willing to move to because I was helping my mom take care of my grandfather. What college did you end up going to? UW-Whitewater for most of my undergrad career, and then a semester at UMass Amherst. And what did you go to school for when you went? So it was my Bachelor of Fine Arts in painting, oil painting mainly. What was the first foray into artwork when you were in this town? Well, I've like been doodling and drawing ever since I could get a pencil in my hand. And I think like a lot of it was just trying to like I was an only child I had a single parent and so it was just kind of like me alone in our house even and so it was just kind of like what are some like fantastical things that I would like to see or like oh I, I used to like pretend and draw like we'd have like an art class which when I went to school it was just art one through four okay. <laughs> so there was no like drawing and painting and stuff that I realized once I got to college that a lot of my classmates had like very nice big art programs at their high school and right. but when I was younger in school there was an assignment where it was like draw your house and your family in front of it kind of thing and I drew uh, my mom me a dad and a sister which oh. I don't have in front of like a house that I did not live in <laughs> like yeah. and I have a very like looking back my house is very cool looking like my biological father built it when I was a baby and stuff so it's this very like weird architectural cathedral ceiling pointy house but I drew this like blue house with a white porch and palm trees in front of it. And so yeah. like just this like this house doesn't exist and I do not have a sister. And I it's funny you're talking like, about it like you don't remember doing it. Yeah, it's a, well I I think I I maybe have a memory of going like, yeah, 
yeah, this is, I'll just lie. Like, this is, this is my family. Like, you guys don't know that. Even though I had friends <laughs> that would come over, like, would know I, like, had trouble discerning, like, oh, I can lie and get away with it. I see it more as, like, it seemed more adventurous, but yours was like, oh, t- before learning how to expand my imagination, it's, I'm going to just imagine that mine is like that family over there. Yeah. Not like you were doing it maliciously. Exactly. Yeah. I think it was a lot of just, like, all of my friends have sisters or brothers. All of my friends have this type of house with a porch or whatever, and, like, it wasn't until late high school that I was like... My, my, like, life is really cool. (laughs) I like my house. I like my my mom. I love that this is our life that we have together and stuff. It wasn't... It it should have been something that I was celebrating more. Mm -hmm. And because it is unique and nice and whatever. And It's not like you were going, I don't want people to know that my life isn't like theirs. You were just like, oh, what would be a cool thing? And that was it. It's like, and I got a sister, you know, (laughs) which is fine. But when did you realize that you could go, oh, wait... I'm flying in space, all that kind of, like, when did you realize, like, you could imagine that as well? Just because I'm really fascinated by this, where you realize you could kind of do escapism in the drawings. Definitely pre-undergrad was, like, I I like illustration. But I think I drew, like, me as Sailor Moon or, you know, just that kind of fantastical. I was very into sci-fi, so, like, a lot of spaceships, a lot of Star Wars things and stuff. So I loved telling stories like that where it's like okay we have i don't know i can't think of any of my little comics that i had off of the top of my head but it you know like a girl astronaut talking with aliens Mm. and i used to draw up like alien questionnaires to give my family members that would come over check if they were an alien (laughs) and like (laughs) would draw little like pictures to go with each question and do you wear a tube sock on your head and like a draw you know like just really my brain was like all over the place (laughs) yeah Yeah. so I liked telling stories like that and I liked that kind of imagination and showing it via a very visual way that's my genesis Mm -hmm. (laughs) is illustration and that fantastical element of storytelling and then once I got into undergrad I was shamed out of that (laughs) how so my undergrad and this is again like I love where I went to school and I had a very good mentors while I was there but there was this sense of like at least in the 2d arts if you start to get super representational where it's I'm trying to say that war is wrong let's say that Mm -hmm. And then it's a person holding a sign that says war is bad, you know, or whatever. Like, then that's too illustrative. That's too on the nose. What's the conceptual background of this? Anytime that we would hear, oh, that's very illustrative in a critique. That's too obvious. That's too elementary. That's too amateur. That's not fine art. And that's not. They were right. We were in a fine art program. I had... One of my friends, who I think is an incredible artist, her senior exhibition, she made her own comic book. And this is so this is a shout out to Maddie, um, (laughs) (laughs) I guess, where she kind of is she kept hearing those criticisms all throughout our entire BFA career and was still just kept doing it. So Mm -hmm. she made like her own comic book and, you know, put up all of her pages that she did throughout the semester or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was so critically kind of torn apart by professors and students of just like, what are you doing? Like, I can't believe she did this. And it was beautiful. It was so well done, but it, it wasn't, it had words. It wasn't illustrated, you know, like it was Mm -hmm. very illustrative. And so there's that odd balance where my oil paintings are very, like, realistic and a lot of figures and a lot of pulling from very kind of representational work, but done in a more, like, fine arty yeah. conceptual way. And I I ended up having kind of comic book panels, too, but they were, like, on birch and they were all, you know, like, oil painting already is very, like fine art you know that's Mm -hmm. like oh you're an oil painter so traditional like I started going back to illustration in a in a way like looking back now it was like oh man I was desperate to get back into storytelling because mine was like the 
confrontation scene in Frankenstein mm. kind of film like it looked like a storyboard I don't know it's my biggest complaint about academia <laughs> When I was in high school, I did painting a little bit. I did watercolor and I and it wasn't I still don't know how to properly do watercolors. I was just like mm. messing around with watercolors like this is nice. Yeah. <laughs> and I went to like Chicago has the School of the Art Institute of Chicago has portfolio days for like high school students to bring in their portfolios. And a bunch of art schools will be there. Professors from each art school will be sitting at like a table and you can be like, here's my portfolio. Do you mind looking at it? I really mm -hmm. want to go to Boston or like whatever. And they'll give you a critique on the spot. I went to a panel for a Boston school because I really liked, I really, really, really like Massachusetts. And she looked at my watercolors and tore them apart, was just like, why would you ever use black on this? You never use black straight out of the tube. That's the first thing you need to know about. But it was just, it was like no positives. Mm. And I left that portfolio review and got in my car and like cried and then went home. <laughs> and it was like, wow, I'll never be a painter. I will don't, I don't know if I can do this art thing. <laughs> got yelled at by a stranger about these paintings that I thought were really good because... Um. They were really good. <laughs> they were pretty good. Like, but, you know, like, it's they're going to give you critiques. But, yeah, but that, you, you at least want one or two good things. Like, but I see good, thing, good things here. Yeah. And you didn't get that. Now, having gone through five years of the art program, now I know that's just like, that was a really bad critique. That woman should never have critiqued me like that. That's not how you do a proper one. Mm -hmm. It's... It is that exchange of here's just some things that I think are working and here are some things that I don't think are working. Have you tried this? Like, mm -hmm. that's a nice critique, not just like straight out the gate. This is bad and here's why. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, oh my God, okay. So when I started undergrad, I immediately was like, I can't do painting because I got torn apart at that portfolio review for painting. I am good at drawing, good at doing really representational drawing, but... I'm still getting pushed really hard, you know, to improve, which is a great thing, you know, mm. but it's just like, don't know what my style is, all of these crazy things. And then I had to take painting for a requirement, like it was a required class. And I like fell in love with oil painting. And I still love oil painting. I just, I, I don't know how to apply it right now to what I'm doing. I was going to ask if yeah. you still paint. Yeah. And well, and what's funny too is like, before undergrad, I hated color. All of my drawings were black and white. Then I really got into color. Like I would consider myself like a colorist. I was obsessed with colors and how they interacted with each other. And oil painting allows you to blend colors just straight on the panel or canvas because it just stays wet forever. <laughs> you know, there's it's an unbelievable length of drawing time. That allowed me to experiment a lot and like figure out really interesting, beautiful ways to color skin or what have you. And then I graduated and did a few large scale panel paintings that I started but didn't finish tried to and like somewhat recently like this was a few years ago i was doing a six foot tall three two and a half foot panel like six by two and a half feet uh true to life size portrait of a friend of mine and could only i got like halfway and was just like this is <sighs> like i'm doing all the things that i really loved in school but like how much of that was like me finding an outlet to like survive the program now it's like okay i can i don't have to do that like i had like just this realization like i don't have to keep doing this who am i doing this for if it's not for myself and not for like a professor anymore and set it down and i bought an ipad pro because that was like one of the best tablets on the market for starting out and having its own processing system and operating system like right in the tablet itself. So it's not connected to something. Mm. And I started doing black and white drawings again. <laughs> then it just kind of grew from there. When did you discover the style? Your style is actually a lot more illustrative. I know your style. I know it when I see it. <laughs> so how did you find it? In undergrad, I completely abandoned illustration. So my paintings do not have that illustrative quality because, again, that was like a sin <laughs> in the BFA world. Uh, and again, I, 
sorry to anybody that is like listening to this and going, no, 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 like that's not true anymore. Cause like, I'm sh- I, I would be very happy if that was not true. So apologies to anybody that's like, oh man, this is not accurate. But it was when I was going to school between 2008 and 2013. So when I got my iPad Pro and I started playing around and I immediately started drawing like I did when I was in high school, Mm -hmm. a little anime, (laughs) like a little, just like this weird combination of a lot of artists that I really liked, techniques that I already knew. So because I had completely abandoned illustration for like five years in college and then three years or so out of college where I just wasn't drawing or doing anything for myself, I was doing a lot of art assistant stuff for the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. What does that entail? Every time that there's an incoming artist, like an incoming contemporary artist, there are times where they need an assistant. And I was just the museum's curatorial assistant, but it was really, I was the project manager and artist assistant for those incoming artists. So they always had a painter on staff or, you know, like I kind of filled all of those roles. One of the biggest shows that I got to show my work in as an artist assistant was the Eric and Heather Chanshots exhibition. That was in like 2014, I think was their exhibition, like February to May. For the entire month of January, I assisted the artists in painting, I think it was eight massive, huge scale murals in the museum, in the main galleries of the museum. There's one full like back wall piece. And so it was me and I hired about 25 other female artists from around Wisconsin. How did you find them? So I went back to my alma mater. I went back to UW-Whitewater and talked with BFA students there because what a great intern opportunity (laughs) like Mm -hmm. to actually be helping out in a museum and pulled some people from there, pulled some people from UW-Madison and there were some friends of some of the staff who were artists that were like in between undergrad and grad school or like that kind of thing that I was overseeing and working alongside the artists to make sure that the murals look beautiful and (laughs) like I was color matching everything because it was basically they had silk screen prints that were huge like they were these big canvases and then we continued the piece off the canvas onto the walls Mm -hmm. so it would be like a physical piece in the center and then a mural going out the side that's one example of and the biggest example where it was just like I was painting every single day and (laughs) like projecting and getting all of that mural stuff down, which I love doing. And hopefully 2020 is going to be filled with murals for the business. I don't know. We'll see. There's my little shout out. If you want a mural done, (laughs) call me. (laughs) So I do have one fun project coming up in March that is mural related, but I can say that. And I am waiting for my friend who's also a business owner to announce the opening of said shop that my mural is going into more of the show after this break were you living in madison when you finished school or how did you end up here so i finished out school at whitewater and then i was planning on getting the heck out of wisconsin actually i applied to university of southern california for the their film program because i was super in love with film by the time like my senior exhibition again looked like film stills i was like i want to get into storyboarding i want to get into production design Mm. i want to you know like There are a lot of film things that I just adored. And so I applied to that program, did not get in, but that worked out for the best. But I was still planning on like, oh, I'll move to LA. I'll, you know, like, get me out of here. Mm -hmm. And then my grandpa got really sick and he raised me with my mom. So I'm like, I want to stick around. I don't want to leave Wisconsin. I think I'll regret it for the rest of my life if I'm not here when you die. So I moved to Madison as the next best thing. Mm -hmm. So then he passed away and I was working at the museum at the time. That was the only reason I stayed in Wisconsin. So now I'm going to leave like, okay, I'm going to quit my job. And now I want to go to New Zealand because I visited New Zealand in 2013 and I loved it. And I'll just like get 
they have the um, holiday working visa that you can get and just work there and do whatever. I was like, oh, maybe I'll get like an artist residency or something. Like, I don't know. And then I got a promotion at the museum when they heard that I wanted to leave and they're like, be our exhibitions manager. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> right? <laughs> that sounds interesting. And so I stayed for that. Okay, well, now I feel like I've made my job obsolete. I, like, created the position, essentially. You mentioned that there's no communication between these departments or whatever, and so I came in to kind of mend that communication and help with logistics and all of that part of the museum. Then that improved, and I didn't really... I, like, worked myself out of my own job, and I was like, okay, I'll leave now. <laughs> and also I, like, left to... I wasn't making any artwork during that time, and that was killing me, and so... It's like, okay, I'll work for the state, <laughs> which is like good money and benefits, but like maybe I'll be there for like a minute and then really leave for real this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Madison, you won't <laughs> you won't keep me here. <laughs> um, I'm dying to find out if you leave. <laughs> <I know. laughs> and then I met my now partner and just happened to move up the street that he worked at and here I am now I'm now we live in this nice place in Madison, and he is the person that builds my stand each time I... Oh, yeah. yeah, he's a woodworker, Andrew Park. He is also for hire. If you ever want, like, a nice, like, market stand, he wants to get into that more. Look up Andrew Park on Facebook. I had sat down with him when he had first kind of started talking about wanting to really get into woodworking. Now that's his career. Oh. He's a carpenter with a firm here in Wisconsin, was talking with him and I drew up the plans that I wanted. I was like, this is the ideal stand that I would want moving forward. Can you build it? And then he did. You weren't doing displays or showing up in places. Like, what was that transition? I saved up a bunch of money working at the state. And then I quit once again. I was like, okay, this did the thing that I needed it to do and be for me for a year. And then I took off for three months and was like, I want to try to start a business. I really want to do this. I It's killing me that I haven't. I was taking classes at UW-Madison. Maybe I'll do art restoration. Business classes? Uh, not business classes. Like So chemistry, I was doing art history classes okay. because that's all like conservation kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then I actually took an interview at the Met <laughs> to be like an intern there wow. in New York and was like, this is very sterile. This is a way to be in art, but like it's still so far removed from actually creating art. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I was even like, I'll take linguistics. Maybe I'll just change my field completely. Like this is something I've always found fascinating. Like I'll jump into this. And so I played around a lot and I was finally like, no, you got to you have to sit down. You have to try to make this work for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so took those three months off, which I'm so happy I did. I ended up not really figuring a whole lot out. Like, mm -hmm. it, like I had to take on part time another part time job this time at a cafe, and which allowed me to keep playing. And it was like during that time while I was at the cafe, and I just came to the point where it's like, okay, I'm getting somewhere, but I, I'm i not, like, living off of this yet. And I was still doing, I was doing these illustrations that were very, like, this is what I think people will like. Mm -hmm. This is what I think people will want to see. This is something I think people will buy. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you could tell that there wasn't any passion in it. And I wasn't having that much fun doing it. And I was really sad that I wasn't seeing a big response to that art and then just one day like sat down I was like here's what I want to draw and it ended up being what's now the witchy skateboarder which is in my shop and it's just like this weird punk girl who has a skateboard and is surrounded by crystals in this weird dark starry area and there are like four animals like spirits coming out of from perhaps inside of her that are like kind of looming over her but it's still super chill and kind mm -hmm. of fun like I have since adopted every time somebody asks to just like how I would describe my work it's always it's dark and whimsical 
it is it has whimsy and it has darkness that's my goal like that's what makes me really happy and that was really well received and then I did another one that was that same kind of that's when I did like the Beltane Gamble which is a girl gambling with an oversized millipede and a bear and a bunny and Mm -hmm. in a weird field and it's just like what is happening (laughs) like and I have stories for all of these I like to think of them as they're like one frozen scene in like a much larger narrative and it's not the end and it's not the beginning it's like right kind of at like end of act two (laughs) like kind of things of just like oh oh what's happening (laughs) like oh man i don't like i want to know more i want to see the whole story but there is no uh, there's nothing else you know it's just that scene and so i just like started making things that i really liked making Mm -hmm. and the fact that i had a story for it like kept me going and the environments for all of that like it was just it was everything I wanted to do. And because of that, it, you can see that passion mm-hmm. and you can see the happiness that I was kind of pouring into these pieces. That's how I found my style. Mm-hmm. That's how I was able to go full time with this is because people buy those prints. This was the turning point for myself as an artist was get weird, do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> like, and that's where that's where your audience will be. It reminds me a lot of the story you were telling me about you standing in front of the blue house with a sister. And I mean, you just were trying to think of like, what am I supposed to draw? I'm just going to make something up. When you did the uh, the first one, it sounded like what you were explaining in the beginning is you were just trying to tell people like, I think they would like this. And here it was, you were just like, well, I have the ability to draw whatever I want. And you created your own story just out of nowhere. I know that you said like, that's how you started your business, but like, what does that? I mean, you don't just draw a picture and go, now I'm a business. <laughs> How did it take off, really? Well, I was still employed as a barista. I was doing these things like on the side. I would maybe call it hobbyist more than like proper illustrator. But like at that point, I had done my work and had a lot of like, I'm failing here and like, okay, we're going to take a risk and just do whatever whatever you want. So because there was such a draw for this the first illustration was like a lot of people going like oh man i would like a print of that or did you post it somewhere or yeah so i posted it on instagram and facebook and so i posted it i got a good response and then i was like okay i'll i'll make prints of these i got like 50 11 by 14s printed and then i came out with the next illustration and that got a good response and then I got prints of those. I think I was doing at that point involved complex illustration like these ones are one a week. I was kind of turning these out pretty quickly and they weren't losing any quality that I wanted them to be at. This was all happening November through December or maybe December through January. I suddenly had a store, like an online store with, I think at that point I had like six, six or seven individual prints. And then I had like little five by sevens that I was doing too, that were from like some of my old drawings that I had done where I was just dinking around and Mm. didn't really have an audience for, but they still got a lot of likes or whatever. So I was like, okay, that's like, I'll look at that kind of as a as a reason to print these perhaps and then I want to be able to go to markets I know from when I was younger I would go to like comic book conventions and anime conventions and those have artist alleys in them so people that are drawing themselves and selling their work and so it's like there are craft markets and Madison is full of markets there yeah. it's incredible and so yeah so I got into my first market and I did very well. It was one of my best markets of the year, <laughs> and but it also colored the way that I was like, oh, this is what I should expect at every market. I was like, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's okay. Like any profit is good. And so I applied to a ton of markets thinking I'll only get into like a quarter of these, like maybe a half of them. And I got into every single one of the markets I applied to. Oh, cool which was very cool, but also like, oh, okay, this is my whole year. It ended up being 28 markets in 2019. 
and 34 market days because some of them are two-day markets. There's so many people that I show with that are like, this is my like 70th for the year, like in December. It's just like, oh my God, <laughs> like, yeah. okay, when do you sleep? <laughs> like, right. it's a lot. So yeah, so I got into a bunch of these markets and then I had to quit my job, part-time job, because I did not have time because... At these markets, people are seeing the work that I'm doing that I really love doing, and then mm. they're wanting to commission things that are similar to that, which I like drawing things that are similar to that. So getting commissions yeah. that way is another reason why you should always put out the stuff that you want to do and not the stuff that people might want, because yeah. people don't know what they want <laughs> until yeah. they see things that they like. And if, it, if those two things go together <laughs> of... People wanting the things that you like to do, that's the perfect business. That's how I've been full-time for since March 2019. What would you say is the hardest part about doing it full-time now? Because I'm doing it full-time, I feel like I need to take on a lot of commissions. And so in an ideal world, I would like to keep doing my original work. Yeah. And the last like truly original piece that I did was in August. Hmm. And that's because I've had so many commissions and markets, which is a beautiful problem to have. That is the reason that I can keep working and doing this without having to get a part-time job. Ideally, I would like to take on bigger commissions that pay more, that then give me a week or two weeks at a time that I can just like do original stuff each month. I just finished my last commission of like 2019 into 2020 at the like the first week of January I'm in this new stage of like oh okay I <laughs> I have no commissions right now and I'm not taking any more until February so it's like okay I can I can do this like I can start making more original stuff again <laughs> I think the one thing that I would want to say to other illustrators starting out is imposter syndrome mm -hmm. is a real thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I just want to cover it just because I wish that I, that I had been told that more, that it was super valid and not to let it just completely stop you from doing what you love. Because every successful person has imposter syndrome. We're all kind of any any job that you're doing or any anything that you're creating for yourself that includes risk and isn't comfortable and also includes putting yourself out there is going to have imposter syndrome which is basically your brain falsely telling you that you're a fraud i've been feeling like that a lot recently my year was big and like it closed off with holidays by the end of it i was just like oh my god i'm so exhausted and burnt out and i feel like some of my stuff I don't want to say suffered, like some of my work kind of suffered towards the end because I was just like, I need to just crank these last few things out, but I'm so tired and I don't know that I can do this, but I, I am paid and so I have to finish this. Mm -hmm. And this last week, even, I've just been like, oh my gosh, I need to find my style again. I need to do my original stuff again. It's okay for that to happen. It's okay to remind yourself like, hey, <laughs> you're a professional or you're going to be able to do this. It takes time. You know, nobody just figures it out instantly. Whoever told you that they do is lying to you. <laughs> like, to anybody starting out, especially in any creative career, which is what this podcast is about, it's okay to to feel like this, but it's also your responsibility to be relentless and push through that and, like, just make your best shit and mm -hmm. just be yourself. And that's okay. And it's interesting, too, because you're having that feeling, but yet you did your best year. So it's just, it's the whole thing. Like, why can't you just enjoy it? Why is it like, this is just a fluke and it's all going to go away and everybody's going to go, who the hell do you think you are? But that's yeah. not it at all. Yeah. I went somewhere the other day and I, I went to a party that there, there were artists there, they were displaying their work and it was very packed. And all I felt like is everybody turned to me and was like, what are you doing here? I felt like everybody else knew each other and I was there and I walked in and I may as well have been a narc. You know, like I was there to just arrest everybody. 
but they weren't. Everybody was super nice to me. Everybody was, I went up and would talk to people or I'd look at something, somebody would turn to me and say something. It was me thinking that. I was projecting my stupid thoughts onto them. These people were nothing but nice to me. And I don't know what the hell that was. And it was just this, I left going, that was just the stupidest thing. And I don't understand why that happens. Our brains are just like wired to, are wired to survive. And sometimes the easiest way to do that is to kind of assume that the best way to survive is to avoid situations like that. There's a really funny Reductress article. It's like a quiz. Reductress is like a satire feminist magazine kind of okay. thing. And the title of it was, Are You Even Good Enough to Have Imposter Syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> And it was like, oh, no, <laughs> like, oh, cut to the heart. Like, yeah, but like, as you said, like I had the best year I've ever had as an artist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that includes like kind of being the in-house illustrator for a room of one's own, which is, mm -hmm. ha is so established in Madison. What an honor to... I don't know, like there's, uh, now I'm like, to have a downtown door mural, like, mm -hmm. like right off of State Street, just all these things that just like happened the last year that each time this would happen, it was just like, oh my God, I'm so lucky. I feel so like, how did this happen? Like, mm -hmm. and then even during those moments, like, oh my God, oh no, like, why am I doing that? Why did, like, why did they think of me to do this? Any illustration that I've done for businesses in town mm -hmm. or just like major things that people see a lot people are supportive and like to support artists mm -hmm. and I forget that I feel like we have always been told like oh you're a starving artist or artists are only bohemian like they mm -hmm. they're like lazy and they like can't make it and stuff and it's like oh yeah that's right we can <laughs> like cal calm down okay right. Get back in their brain. Like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Like, And it's sad that we do that, but it's also a nice reminder to, I don't know, always, also always tell artists that you really like and you're too nervous to maybe tell this to. Like, please tell them that you like their work. It'll make their day. To learn more about TL Luke, you can visit the website at tl-luke.com. The music for this episode is by my band Lorenzo's Music at lorenzosmusic.com. If you enjoy this show, you can subscribe to it at my website, tomraiswebsite.com, or on Spotify or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Just look for Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'll be back next week with another episode, so until then, so long. Mm -hmm.